this video just needs a little bit of an introduction before we start. I've been asked a number of times in the comments, can I teach you how to reverse engineer circuit boards? And yeah, to some extent I can teach you that there are techniques. And I've also been asked, can I teach you effectively the art of electronic repair? And the answer to that, to be honest, is no. And it's no because nobody can teach you the art of electronic repair. But you can learn it. And there's a distinction here. You can learn the art of electronic repair, but nobody can teach it to you. And I'm just going to explain why I believe that is the case, and then you can all argue with me. No, sorry, that's the wrong word. You can all debate it in the comments below, yeah? But I'll take it with an analogy. So back in the 80s, I went to the local university and did a night course, three hours a week, paid for by my employer. And I took a course called Microprocessor System Design and Programming. And as part of this, we were programming in assembly language. Now, assembly language is a fairly simple thing because you have a, a finite number of operational codes, opcode as they're called, instructions. And each instruction handles data in a certain way, what are called the operands. And it's all like in black and white, it's a very fixed set of rules with assembly programming. And anybody can learn the instructions. It's not that difficult to go and learn all the instructions. And you have your little programmer's notebook by you, so if you can't quite remember the opcodes or the order of them, you can just look them up. So anybody can write assembly code programs. But, well, you'd think that's the case, but in actual fact, no, you can't. Because... There's another side to assembly programming. There's the science. That is knowing all the opcodes, all the instructions, and what operands or arguments they require to operate on. Two is kind of like the art. So the art is the way, if you like, an art form. It's like putting them all together in a useful manner, yeah? Making a coherent picture out of all these little building blocks. And we used to say assembly programming is half science, half art and half voodoo black magic and the reason it's three halves is because it's a big topic yeah <laughs> but the reason we say it's half voodoo or black magic is because even if you know all the instructions and you have some or you know the kind of art of putting it together unless you know the voodoo you'll never be a good assembly programmer yeah and Repair work is the same. So we have the science. Yes, you need to understand the electronic components and what they do and how they operate and such like. Yeah, You have the art. The art is understanding basic circuits, op amps, oscillators, amplifiers and such like. That is the art. But the voodoo, and I call it voodoo, but it isn't really. The voodoo, when I thought about it, is a mindset. It's a way of thinking. And that is what appears to be the voodoo. And any good repair technician will have this way of thinking. The best analogy I can put it is that I've spoken to other repair techs and programmers, funnily enough, the two fields together. And... All the good ones are the sort of people that can be working on a fault or a problem or an algorithm or whatever, who finish work with a job unfinished, they go home and relax without thinking about it, and then at four in the morning, they suddenly wake up with the answer in the head. If not the answer to the problem, the way to move forward with it, the way to get further with it. And I do this, I do this all the time. Some of my best ever ideas have been 4am ideas. The $1 short circuit tracer was a 4am idea. Yeah, and there's been others on the channel. There's been repairs I've come back and fixed, which I couldn't fix the day before, because 4am gave me the answer. So if you are a 4am wake up and thinking person without even realising you were thinking about the problem, you can be a good repair technician. Yeah. Everyone I've met seems to have this ability. So, a bit of waffle about that. Now, this way of thinking. When you have something you basically don't know what it is, or you might know what it is, you don't really know how it works. 
you've got a circuit board or an item or a product that you've been asked to repair or you want to repair. There's a few ways of going about it. So you can get quite a long way just by looking at it, visual inspection, looking closely, preferably with a microscope and go all around painstakingly and you'll find a lot of problems, yeah? Another way is to effectively reverse engineer the device. A good way of going about that is to look up the part numbers of all the ICs, find the data sheets. Same with MOSFETs or the P channel or N channel, find the data sheets. And then from the data sheets, it helps you to work out what a circuit is doing. Otherwise, you just start tracing it out and draw it on paper. There's a couple of other ways of going about this. And to be quite honest, there's many ways as there are at technicians, really. But another way to go about it is effectively to start removing and testing every component in turn until you come to the point where you can't remove and test anymore. If you find something faulty, you replace it. Does it now work? If you get to the point where you've removed and tested everything you can possibly test, all you're left with is the things that you can't test and you replace all of them. Yeah. That's another method. Now, these methods don't work on everything. Some are better for certain types of jobs than others, yeah. But there's that kind of school of thought, if you like. There's that methodology. Another one is to look at the item and mentally, or on paper, break it into building blocks. And then, via the nature of the fault, identify which of those building blocks are the most likely to have the faulty component and then trace or replace or test all the parts in that area. It's a more targeted version of the previous method if you like. Another method is to start taking voltage and resistance measurements and look for something that's wrong. And if you have a knowledge of components you should really know what's wrong. When you measure a voltage or a resistance on an item that you're repairing, if you don't know what to expect the reading to be or what you think it should be or what is reasonable, then there's no point in taking the measurement because what does it tell you? Yeah, what does it tell you? It's like, I don't know if you where you are, who wants to be a millionaire? It's like going 50-50 when you haven't got a clue. What's it matter which two are left? You haven't got a clue. Yeah. So if you have enough knowledge of components, transistors and resistors and Ohm's law, you can get quite a long way that way. And the final thing I mentioned about repair work is this kind of like intuition. This is what I'm kind of talking about, about the voodoo, the black magic. A gut feeling, an intuition that you know where the problem is likely to be. And it may be because you've seen it before. Yeah, that's a good way. You've seen this before and you sort of knew what it was. Yeah, that's a good way. But what you have to be prepared to do, and this is this mindset again, is make suppositions in your mind. Think, well, okay, this or this. And then every time you make the supposition, you need to prove it. Am I right? Am I wrong? And expect to go down some blind alleys with this. You're not going to take a linear path from opening the box to fixing it, okay? That's, if you like, quick talk. That was 10 minutes talk, sorry. That's 10 minutes, but I'm just hopefully putting across some idea of what makes a good technician. And you can all be good technicians. You can learn it. But as I said to start, nobody can teach it to you, Yeah. Nobody can teach it. You can learn it. You, you develop your own intuition. Yeah, that's really what I'm trying to say. This video then. I'm going to repair something which is quite pointless to repair. Okay, somebody asked me to fix it, but you might think, well, why am I interested in repairing this thing? You'll find it's a battery charge. You'll see it in a minute. Why are you going to repair this thing? You could throw it in the bin and buy another one for 10 and probably have some spare batteries go with it. But that isn't the point. The point with this is learning. If you can't repair things like this, if you can't reverse engineer things like this, you've got no chance of doing it with graphics cards and motherboards and all the rest of the things, which are by far more difficult to repair, for the main part, yeah, for the main part. So, in this video, I'm going to use a mixture of some of the things I was talking about. I can't use data sheets. 
you'll see why i do a, some reverse engineering and some intuition i think that's what i want to show you in this hopefully guys follow the way i'm thinking on this follow the way i'm thinking yeah i go down a few blind alleys but follow the thought the logical process if you skip this to the end you'll find out what was wrong with it but you're not going to learn anything <laughs> i'll tell you that you're not going to learn anything it's a pointless thing anyway you might as well throw it away but if you watch it through then you're another step to becoming a good repair technician okay guys here we go hi guys welcome to another learning electronics repair video it's strange some of the things i get asked if i can repair but hey customers want to pay me to do it i'll try and do it yeah battery charger i've never actually opened one of these up i'm guessing it's a switch mode power supply with some sort of constant current source that makes sense yeah this one does uh double a triple a and the nine volt pp3 type so i can see yeah that's strange those go different to that but there must be a reason for that i guess okay well that's how he says so he says it's dead and i think that's basically what i found if i just get a uh, power connector here and I plug it in it doesn't do anything yeah nothing happens nothing happens whether that's because there's no batteries in I don't know but he seemed to think it should light up so let's see let's see first of all can we get into it It's kind of loose the cover. I think somebody's tried to open this up before anyway, as the top and bottom of it. <laughs> so to speak. Let's see. see if we can remove the top from the bottom. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see if we can do that. This screws a bit. I think they're a bit chewed up actually. It's like they've been Can you see? Yeah. It's like it's been opened up several times before, or someone's tried to do it with a very badly fitting screwdriver. Okay. So then you wonder if it's packed in several times before as well. Or if several people have looked at it and couldn't fix it. Let's see. Well, it's coming. This one seems to be the uh, one that's holding it together. Maybe it's not a switch mode power supply at all. Maybe it's a linear power supply. Just looking what I can see inside it. Yes. <laughs> it doesn't want to give it up, does it? Yeah, it's like we thought it's a power supply, but it's not like we thought because it's linear, yeah. It's a power supply, but not as we knew it. <laughs> okay, so attached to that is this PCB, and the whole thing comes out. Uh, yeah, what looks like lollipop sticks. Oh, this seems to have pushed back, maybe. They're not very springy, those, you know. There's not much anything like in the way. I guess this acts as tension on this one. And it has an integrated circuit. Yeah. It has an IC in here. I wonder if it's marked. Let's get the microscope and let's have a look. Yeah. There we have it. So it kind of contains some like higgledy piggledy. That's a good word. Higgledy piggledy components that are kind of like almost touching each other here and there and obviously <laughs> I like the way they fitted this zealot diode here almost as like an afterthought that one that kind of like wraps around the capacitor and goes down there so yeah it's not particularly well constructed I would say it has a green LED in the middle and clearly that's not lighting up so I guess this is why he says it's dead because the LED doesn't light up what else we got? We got a few more leaning over resistors. Yeah. 
I don't think anything was actually shorter against anything. I do like that. Zenny. <laughs> I like the way they've constructed that. Uh, yeah. I mean, I'm guessing these things are leaning towards each other. Yeah. Focus it. They like connected together anyway, so that's not a problem. And it has an IC. And the IC is somebody's removed the numbers off. Probably because this is like a top secret design or something. Let's see if we can actually read that by putting a bit of isopropyl on or shining light across it or other various techniques. Let's see if we can work out what it is, just out of interest. Well, I can't see anything there, but I'm pretty sure it's upside down. That's the first thing we can say. So let's go that way. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's the right way up now. See if a bit of isopropyl will actually show anything on that. I don't think it will, but hey, it's fun, yeah? Well, there's a bit of ISO. And nothing came up. I don't think we're going to read it that way. Yeah, I don't think we're going to read it that way. So, how do we work out what an IC is? if the markings have been removed and if we wanted to know well that's a good question isn't it let's see if we can figure out what this is but first of all let me just see if i can get it working so there's no power so let's go back to the overhead camera and see if we can figure anything out with this we have a few more things we can see as well so you can kind of see, I hope this is kind of like symmetrical. So here you have a three ohm resistor, three zero and gold as times 0 0.1. Then we have a uh, one, three and no zeros, a 13 ohm resistor. And on this side, we have the same thing. Yeah, so you can see another one here, 0 0.3 of an ohm and a 13 ohm. And if you look, you've got the two blue wires come down here. And next to them are rectifier diodes. I'll just tilt it a bit. So you can see this is producing the positive voltage rail. So the current flows in the direction towards the cathode, like the arrow and the diode symbol to here. And the same thing applies here. We have a diode to there. And if you look, you can see that this is where the blue wire comes in. This is the diode. Then it goes through one of the resistors. In series of the other resistor, it's also got a tap to here. Ah, yeah, so this three ohms, we can figure out what this is exactly now. This is a current sense resistor because all the current flowing through here then flows through here, yeah? This end of the 13 ohm resistor goes to here. And if you look, that is one of the battery terminals, yeah? It's there. The 3 ohm actually goes to here. So the current is flowing actually through both. It must be a different current, right? Okay. When we go to the larger battery, we go through the 3 ohm. When we go to the triple A, which must have a lower charging current, I guess, it goes through both of them. So maybe it's not current sense. This is just limiting the current for the double A and limiting current more for triple A. You can see that's the way it's wired up, yeah? So your battery then comes across to this terminal, yeah? Which is the other end. And that then goes to here also. Now, this is the other battery terminals, the second one's in, one, two, yeah? That's that. And then the other end of those batteries comes to here, yeah? And this also connects to the other end of the PP3 battery, which is, I'm guessing, the negative end there, yeah? So they all come to this point here. Okay. And this point here then goes to, there's a transistor here, you can see it there. So that must be a constant current source. That transistor is forming a constant current source. And it looks like we have exactly the same symmetrical pattern on the other side, yeah? So the same thing applies through the two different resistors going to the different terminals, triple A or double A, comes down to here, yeah, and then 
goes back up to the other battery terminals and to that one second one and yeah sorry i can't get the depth of field sorry depth of focus well yeah, depth of field properly but you can see what i'm seeing yeah you can see what i'm seeing and then from here does this go to the other transistor well actually no both of these are connected together yeah all these negative points so there's one ground point one two three four for all the batteries so this is the ground point for all of them but the two sides have a different supply now this tells us a few things yeah first thing it tells us is that you can only put batteries in in pairs for the aa and the aaa you can only put them in pairs you can't put one it will not charge you can only put them in pairs that you get a different charging current for the different types of battery and that the two sets of pairs can charge at a different rate you can have different current flowing that's how i figure that out is the pp3s obviously you can charge one or two but they kind of like independent if you like again one charging one side one charging the other side i'm guessing this has actually been done now the more i think about it so you can charge a pp3 battery on one side and you can charge two aa or triple a batteries on the other side that's why we have the two independent halves so it looks like these two blue wires effectively allow for all the charge current to the batteries of the various combinations and then we still need to get back down to the black wire which is here to return so where's that black wire go to well what I can see down here straight away the two red wires also have two diodes a symmetrical or two supplies again so that black wire somehow comes back to here I can't just quite see where it goes, but I'm pretty sure if we get the test meter for the first time, we can figure out that comes into here somewhere. Let's have a look. I mean, logically, it must come back to here because the constant current source is here. So, yeah, there. So that end of this transistor is the constant current source. Yeah, you can see now it actually comes all the way down here. Looks like it's also obviously going to be ground for this chip as well. So what are the two red wires for? Well, my best guess, and it's a pretty good one, I think. First of all, they have diodes on them. Yeah, one, two diodes. The smaller diodes than these are and the resistors. So whatever they're supplying draws less power than the charging circuit. And what else can draw power on here? Well, the only thing can draw power is this chip. So... We should be able to figure out, first of all, do either of these diodes go to this chip? Pin 14 is the most likely place. No, sorry, pin 16. Okay, not quite as simple as that, unless I didn't have a connection. There's another diode down here. One of these, I'm sure it will supply this chip. Oh, there's a capacitor in the middle as well. That'll be on the supply to the chip. So those two diodes from the red wires don't supply that chip. They're doing something else, yeah. They're doing something else. But from this red wire, if you look, there's two diodes coming from it, one, two, yeah? And on this side, there's only one. There's nothing under here, no. So, I suspect this diode is the one that's supplying this chip. It also comes down towards this capacitor, which is another good clue. Well, it doesn't come directly to there. I see another one. I've got there's quite a few diodes on this, to be quite honest. Well, 
Well, that appears to be the power to this chip, and it appears to have power on pane 10. Yeah, if that's what it's doing. So we can see basically the charge path for the batteries, all of them, are between these two blue wires, and this must be the negative, the center tap. And they all come back eventually to this transistor here on the middle pin. So let's have a look at our two transistors now. We can see, first of all, the mounted effectively back to front. I haven't checked to see through the same marking. I haven't bothered to look, I might do in a minute. But they kind of mounted like back to front. And if you look at the two legs closest to each other, which effectively is this one and this one, they're connected together. It's just ground. It would make sense if it was ground. Let's go to the black uh, wire. Yeah, so that's ground. So depending if the MPN or PMP transistors, this is probably is either going to be the emitters or the collectors. I suspect it's the emitters because normally on these transistors, the collectors are the two center pins. And that would be the base then. And the base of this is connecting to the collector of that one. That would be a sensible configuration. But let's have a look. Let's see if our transistors at NPN. So in that case, we would have, this would be the base. If it's NPN, I'll see a diode junction. Yes, one there and one there. And then what's between these two? Well, that's not a diode junction. That's just climbing up. Yeah. So we definitely have a diode junction here and here. So this will be NPN and this will be the base. And according to that, the other one's kind of upside down. So this would be, if it's NPN, yeah. Yeah, we have diode junctions again. There's a junction there, but nothing there. Okay, so we can definitely see the two diode junctions. If this is the base, then this will go to, uh, yes, a resistor. You can see a resistor in there, which is, let's see, what is it? It's uh, a 10K, which is quite sensible for a, a base resistor, brown, black, orange, that's a 10K. So that will be driving the circuit. That will be the input. And that goes, yeah, it goes, goes back to this chip here. So it goes to this chip on pin, let's see, which pin, third one down. In fact, I can probably do it from this side. So from the third one down here to this resistor. Yeah. So that is the output of the pin on, no, sorry, that is the output of the chip on pin three. So we know that, we know it outputs on pin three. We know where ground is. We know that the collector of this drives the base of this one. And then the collector to the emitter of this one is the charging current. So this might be using, I'm imagining probably pulse width modulation. It would make sort of sense. If that's the case, I can see a capacitor here and some resistors. And, if, and I can see another little capacitor here. If there's a pulse width modulator, it's going to have a timing circuit. So it would make sense. It would have resistor capacitor. This one here, oh, see this one here? I think that's brown for one percent, so it's a close tolerance resistor. Three three zero. And is that yellow? Four more zeros. Three three zero 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 zero. That's like a three point three meg resistor, high value. Is that connected around here? Yeah. Connects to our capacitor. And does it connect to the chip? Yeah, it also connects to the chip as well. On pin. Okay, eight. Without even powering this up yet, we know quite a few things now. So we know the charging path. We know this is the constant current source. We know this is likely to be a pulse width modulator of some sort. And that there's timing components are probably these. 
and they are connected to pin 9 of the chip. Pin 8 of the chip is ground. And then the power to the chip is going to come from here somewhere. Now, the most likely place is where this capacitor is. Makes sense. And next to this capacitor, we have tucked in here a zenith diode. Now, the reason for a zenith diode is to give a stable voltage. And the only thing I can think of on here that needs a stable voltage, unless it's a reference for the constant current source, is this chip. I think it's going to be this chip, so if we just go from one end of the zenith, the uh, cathode, does that go to our chip? Yeah, it does on pin four, pin 16, and that's quite common, so pin 8 is normally ground, the pin up here, 14 or 16, depends on the package, or even pin 8 on an 8 pin is normally power, unless it's an op-amp chip, op-amp chips often have the power across the middle like you know pin 4 and pin 12 that sort of thing so we know that that zenith diode is going to be the power and is that coming back from um uh, rectifier i'm guessing well it doesn't go to this diode let's see where it goes to there's some more diodes in here well actually it won't go to a diode thinking about it it'll come to a a resistor, if there's a zenith diode there regulating, the supply must come through a resistor to limit the current into the zenith diode. Yeah, that makes sense. And by the zenith diode and the capacitor, there's a resistor here, R3, which looks like it's yellow, violet, brown, which is a 470 ohm. So that could be the resistor that effectively limits the current into a zenith. Again, 470 ohm seems about right. So if that 470 ohm resistor is feeding our zener, and we know it is, and we know the zener is going to pin 16 on here, we know it's being fed by the resistor here. So the other end of that resistor, if you can find it, should go to the rectifier diode feeding the power in. So let's have a look. So it's here somewhere. Well, that's a short. Oh, that reads 461 ohms, or 0 0.46 k. That's close enough. So this end of it, if it goes to the power coming in here, probably I'll do it through a rectifier diode. Let's have a look. Now, so this is one of the power lines coming in. Yeah, and there's a rectifier diode there. So there must be here a diode. Yeah, which is that one. So that diode is rectifying the voltage coming from here it's going through a 470 ohm resistor to this zener and the junction of those two is going to the chip giving that stable voltage so that's that there's a few more components around and it looks like these pins red wires these do something else as well so you can see there's another diode going off that way there there's another diode there's only one this side because this doesn't power this chip this one does through here so there's two more positive supply rails here going somewhere into this lot. And I'm not totally sure at the moment what they are doing. Let's see if we can figure that out. Well, once again, we can figure out quite a bit of this without powering it up yet. So you can see this diode here goes to a resistor next to it, which is this one. Okay, and that, if you look at the marking, red, red, black, is a 22 ohm resistor. And if you look on the other side, you've got the other one, this diode. And this goes to this resistor here, next to it. And again, that's another 22 ohm resistor. So those resistors are identical. It's another symmetrical circuit, so it's got to be something to do with the charging. Which again makes sense because we know the path from the blue wires for all the main charge. So it's not the main charge circuit, but it's got something to do with the charging. And it looks like if we find the junction of the here, yeah, of this and the resistor, which is here, I believe, 22 ohms. Yeah, 22 ohms. Then goes to the LED. 
And the other end of the LED goes to the positive end of the charge circuit. So it looks like these diodes and the associated resistor are to do with the charge indicators. These will be the charge indicators. So we know what they do. So we've pretty much figured out the whole circuit now, basically, or close to that. So now we've finally done that. Shall we power it up and see what's wrong with it, yeah? Before I do just power it up, I want to check one more thing. We know the green LED isn't lighting up, so we need to just figure out where that connects to. So you can see the LED is here. One leg clearly goes to ground, which is the black wire, and the other leg goes up here somewhere into this lot. Now, there's a little clump of components down in here, which is a bit difficult to see where it goes. So the best way to do this with these sort of PCBs is to take a torch and shine it through. These type of torches are best, like the long flat ones. And now we can sort of see where it goes. So we should be able to find it. So this is the end of the LED. And it goes, well, probably to a resistor, actually. Yeah, it goes to this one. So this is a 2.2K resistor. So that makes sense. It needs a current limiting resistor. So the other end of the resistor will go to wherever the power comes from. And it's a bit hard to see through the PCB here, but it looks like it heads this way somewhere. It's coming from the chip. Well, it's not the power to the chip. Yeah, it does. It goes to the chip on pin, let's see, three. Yeah, yeah, it goes to, it goes to pin three on the chip. So we know the LED is, is on pin three of the chip. Yeah. Which also seems to go to... A few other places as well. Oh, pin three of the chip is the one that's driving the base for the pulse width modulator. So I, I'm, it goes there. That's where it looks like it's going. Not quite where I expected it to go, but it certainly does go there. All right, let's power it up now. Let's see what it actually does or doesn't do. I'm back on my analog scope today just I felt like it. What did we talk about on the last video? Make sure your scope's working. This is 300 millivolts and I've got about a division and a half. And I'm on 200 millivolts per division. So that's good enough. I'm also on AC by the looks of it. Let's go to DC. Now let's have a look at our board. So this is, should be oscillating, I would have thought. Oh, well, <laughs> it's not exactly oscillating. Let's just go uh, move it down here so we've got a little bit more space. Okay. Off the range, go again. Get onto this. Well, it's kind of oscillating, just slowly. Up and range again. Let's put some batteries in this, some rechargeable batteries, and see what it does. I mean, these pins which are like rising up in voltage and going back down again, like a triangular wave. That kind of makes sense because you'd expect this IC, whatever it's doing, to increase the voltage to the point where it sees a certain current flowing through the batteries, like a constant current source, but it has to effectively generate a constant current by setting an appropriate voltage but the output from this and i'm pretty sure it is the output because it goes to these transistors doesn't seem to do anything like there's no output so let's try as i say connecting some batteries to this and just figure out which way it goes in here and see whether or not it then generates any voltage across the battery terminals well, it's quite interesting, really. I mean, the lights are not illuminating the LEDs. It might look like they are, but it's just the fact that there's like a reflection here. They're not actually illuminating. Well, if we look at these batteries I've put in on this side, and we just measure across the two, you'll see 
2.67 volts, yeah, varying slightly. Now, if I switch the charger off, 2.57, switch the charger on, 2.7. So it looks like it's actually charging the batteries, even though the LEDs are not coming on. The best way to prove that is to leave many a little bit, yeah, let's just see what happens if I leave the batteries in and do they actually charge? Yeah, it seems to be charging all right. I mean, if you look across the battery, so from ground, which is here, these are the ground, yeah. This one's reading now 1.33, 1.34, so it's definitely gone up, started about 1.2 something. The two together, 2.68, so that's increased, yeah. So that's what we have. If we go across this one singly, 1.33, yeah. They've also balanced up because one was reading higher than the other originally. But there's no lights on. The lights are not lit up. And the guy told me it's supposed to light up. Well, maybe he's wrong. <laughs> because there's something very strange, really, with why he says this isn't working. If we look on the other side of it, so we go, this is ground, yeah, this is, you know, this is ground. So, this is the transistor that's effectively connecting from the return of these batteries to ground. If we go on here, we have 0.46. So, the other end of the battery, which we go over here, I'll just find the correct terminal. Yeah, it's now 2.7, it's gone up a bit, yeah. So, this is the first battery. The second one is in series from here reading 1.39 so this ends about 0.46 now that comes through this transistor we were looking at so this is the collector of the transistor 0 0.046 yeah 0 0.046 I probably said it wrong before uh, so this is the emitter of the transistor if you look at the base it has 0.76 on so this base is being turned on and that actually comes through a resistor, which we looked at, which goes over to here. So this is 7.2. This end of the resistor is 0.76, yeah. So obviously it's dropping some voltage across the resistor. It won't be much current because it's only the base current. So the other end of this resistor actually goes over to the IC. Over here. Yeah, 7.23. So that's what's coming out of our IC. If we switch it off... It's gone, yeah? Switch it back on. It's back again. So it's obviously turning this transistor on, and this transistor is giving us the correct current to charge the batteries. So it's working. It's actually working. Why the green LED doesn't light up, I don't know. I mean, it's possible the green LED is supposed to light up, and these only come on when the battery is fully charged. I don't have any instructions for this, but what I do know for certain is the batteries are charging up to about 2.68, 2.7 now, yeah? And if we wait a little bit, look, you see? Uh, it's slowly charging. The batteries is what it's supposed to do. So, it looks like handy handy has given me a charge that the green LED doesn't light up. And it's working, and these red lights probably come on when it's fully charged. That, that's my uh, guess on it. That's my take, yeah. I've left it charging for just a little while, and this red LED has come on. So it's certainly charging the batteries. If we just go across this pair, we have 2.7 volts. And we go across this pair, which is this way around. And we have almost the same 2.68, 2.69 nearly volts. So although only one of the LEDs has come on, it is definitely charging the batteries. Let's open it up again and have a look on the other side. And let's check some voltages on this and see if we can figure anything else out. And why this red LED isn't on. And what's going on with the green one, why it doesn't light up. We know this point is ground. So with it switched on, if we go from here... This is where the charge is coming through the, the two resistors in series. 
that we were looking at earlier. And we can see that this one has up 2.84 volts and 2.86. So they're basically the same, really. That's charging the two pairs of batteries. And it comes back to this point here. Now, this point, this is like the common ground, if you want, the common return. It's not ground, the common return, yeah. Comes here, that's got 0 0.08 of a volt on. And that is going to the transistors. So, this transistor collector has 0 0.08 volts on, yeah. And this is the emitter, this is ground. So, that is turned on. It's obviously, in fact, it's turned fully on by the looks of it. This is the base. Yeah, it has 0.783 volts on the base. So that really is turned fully on. So that's coming from somewhere. Well, the collector of this one, that's what I think was driving it, 0.78 volts. But the base is off. So where is that coming from? Oh, there's a resistor here. Yeah, there's a resistor here. We've looked at it before, I think. 7.2 volts. Oh, this was the 10K resistor. So the base of this transistor is being turned on via this resistor. And that goes up to, effectively, pin 16 of the chip. That's the power coming in, regulated by the Zener diode that we were looking at. So that's what's turning the transistor on. So... This transistor isn't driving it because it's off. What's it? Oh, yeah, I see what it's doing. It's not doing what I thought it was. I thought this transistor effectively has been driven by this chip, which it is. I mean, it goes through another 10K resistor here and here, but it's off, yeah? Pin 3 of the chip has nothing on it. There's nothing... There, there's no drive coming from chip. And that's the one that goes via the other resistor here and turns the green LED on. So obviously the green LED is off because there's nothing coming from the chip there. So this is turned on. This one's off. This is not driving this one, but I do know now what it's supposed to be doing and how it's supposed to work. So let's have a look. Let's draw it out a little bit. What we have then, basically, we have on our transformer two blue wires two red wires and the black and the black is a center tap and this effectively this is our ground naught volts yeah and this is our two blue wires and then there's the two red wires and the two red wires i'm sure it will be another pair of taps on here generating either more or less voltage than the blue. We can have a look in a minute. And I'll put blue here because I should have put blue here, yeah. So I've just put the blue ones on at the moment, but we have the red ones as well. We know that. So basically, the two blue wires go via rectifier diodes. And then they go via these two resistors. So we've got the 3 ohm and the 12 ohm. Yeah, 3 ohm, 12 ohm, and the same here. 3 ohm, 12 ohm. I used to be able to write, you know. I used to be able to write properly until we had computers and we all started using keyboards. And I've kind of lost that skill over the years. I mean, heaven knows how people get on who didn't develop the skill in the first place because they had the computers to start off with. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. Anyway... There we go. That's why I can't write properly, by the way. So, we've got that. We've got that. Now, this then effectively goes into your two batteries in series on both. And this charges the batteries. Okay? And coming out the other end of the batteries are connected together. Yeah? They're both connected together. And that goes to the collector of the transistor. And the emitter goes to ground. Okay? And this transistor should limit the current. Now, we have a 7.2 volt supply. We've just measured it. And that comes actually off one of the red wires. So one of the red wires has a, a diode 
coming in here, we have a, uh, a resistor, we have a zener diode. Uh, and this is feeding our our chip on pin 16. This is our power of our chip, yeah. This is ground again. And this is going to pin 8 of our chip. We've measured that. Okay. And this was, I can't remember what it was, a 400 ohm resistor or something like that. And this is a Zener, yeah. And there's also from here... the capacitors are smooth so that's what we actually have yeah and i'll say that's coming from one of the red wires which also have two more diodes which come into the charging circuit somewhere so that's what we have yeah now this transistor the base of this goes through a uh, 10k and that actually connects to here pin 16 so this we can call it vcc and this goes to our transistor. So basically, whenever we have power, this transistor is turned fully on. It's just on. Yeah, but we need it to limit the current. And the way it's doing, as I can see now, we have the other transistor, which I thought was driving the base of this one. And it is, but not quite the way I thought it was. So this again goes to ground, and the base of this, another 10K, goes back to this chip. On pin three, uh, pin three. We also we know we have uh, ten and nine, and these are connected where the left, where the capacitor and the resistor was. This is where we have the like the, the slow sawtooth wave coming in. Slow oscillation taking several seconds to ramp up and down. That's there, yes. Yeah? So that's what we have. So I can see what's supposed to happen now. This is supposed to be some sort of comparator. It's supposed to be comparing the voltage across the battery with this oscillator or something. And it's supposed to be turning this transistor on. And when you turn this transistor on, it drags the base down. Yeah. If you turn this transistor fully on, if it was completely on, this transistor would, be, would effectively short the base of this one to ground and this would be off. And the current flow here would stop it. It'd be like an open circuit, yeah? This transistor's off, then because of the supply from here, this is fully on, and that's how it's doing it, yeah? That's passing full current. At the moment, this transistor is just off, so we're getting the full current flow into the batteries, yeah? The green LED goes from here. Sorry, I'm drawing it backwards. To ground via... Uh, the resistor so that, that's our uh, green yeah now the way i see it, the only way the green led can light up is if this pin is high certainly more than say two and a half volts for green led 2.4 something like that with its resistor and that's enough to fully turn this transistor on and stop the charging so that green led must only turn on when it's not charging and that must happen when it's fully charged yeah so that's how this should work and it ain't doing it we've got the two red wires which are tapped off here somewhere i'm going to measure them mate, and see where they come if they are lower or higher voltage than the blue and they are going into that red led somewhere off those and i'm guessing the red led comes on when the battery is charging on its side and the green comes on when they fully charged. Yeah, that's how I think it should be working. And that's what ain't happening. So I think the key to this is why is one of the red LEDs not lighting up when both battery pairs are clearly charging, yeah? Because whatever's causing that red LED not to work is probably upsetting the whole circuit. That's my take on this. I uh, hope you liked a bit more of that. Uh, copyright. Mm. Work ad. I've gone off dicky card now, it's work ad now, yeah. Copyright work. Ad. Okay. We know a bit more about a chip and we know something about why it isn't working. Let's see if we can now figure out what's wrong with it. Yeah. Let's have a look what's coming out of our transformer. So we want volts AC. Now, there's no point in doing this, would you agree, unless we've got some idea of what we'd expect, yeah. 
And there's no point in measuring voltages when you're trying to fit something if you don't know what to expect. Because if you don't know what to expect, then what does the reading mean to you, regardless of what it is? Yeah. So before you measure anything, you should always think, what am I expecting to see? This is a key point of repair work, really. So let's have a look. So the blue wires we know are here. This is giving 6.4 volts AC. And this is giving 6, the same, yeah? And the red ones, only more, 12.4, 12.4. So we can put them on our diagram in a minute. We know what's there now, 6, 6.4, 12.4. So the 6.4 AC, once it comes through the rectifier diode, which is basically before it gets to this resistor, this is the DC voltage. Just get on this again, slipping. 3.9. Yeah. Obviously, AC on here. 6.4. DC on here. 3.9. What's on the other side? Should be the same. Close. 3.98. 3.98. So quite four, yeah. Quite four. What's on the coming out of these red ones? So we have some rectifier diodes. Where are they going? Well, there's 6.1 there. 6.4 there. 6.1. I'll have to just figure out where these rectifier diodes are. 6.1, 6.1. Well, they're certainly symmetrical. I can see that. They, they, they're symmetrical either side. I'll have to take the batteries out and see where they actually go to. Okay, I've done that. I've just turned it over, zoomed down a little bit. Put it back on again. So, what have we got? Onto the black again. Rectifier diodes. 5.7. Six point two. So it's actually a bit higher on one side than the other. Unless it's changing. Is that indicating there's something a little bit different on one side to the other? Because the AC coming in should be the same. Why have we got a slightly different DC level on both sides? So this is the one side of it, AC. 13.3 with no load, fair enough. 13.3. So we have the same AC coming in on both. 13.3. 13.3. But on DC. 5.6. 5.6. Six Why are they different? Let's check the LEDs as well. I'll switch it off. Check the LEDs. Okay. So this should have enough power in diode mode to actually light up the LED, you would think. Let's see if we can get it to do it. So this one goes this way around. 1.6. Is it even... If it's lighting, I can't see it. I can't see it lighting up here. What's this one? Maybe I had it the wrong way round, you know. Maybe I had it the wrong way round. No, that green LED, I would have expected to illuminate when I put my uh, meter across it. 1.6. What do the red ones do? They should light up. Oh! Oh! Well, that LED reads short. They both read short, actually. But one of them lights up. So that doesn't make a lot of sense, does it? That the LEDs. This one's. Ah! Well, now it's not reading short and it is lighting up, yeah. I don't know why. So that one is actually okay. 
Does this one actually go the opposite way round? We short that way. Let's go the other way. Well, this one's going to be short. I'm just thinking this way up. I, I thought this was the one that was lighting up when I was charging. LED definitely reads short, yeah. So we take that out. And this one reads... Reads okay. I'm just slipping the two leads together, I think. No doubt that one is short. And that one reads okay, but doesn't light up. Let's take them out. I've just made a note, by the way. You can see inside the LEDs, you have like a big hoof and a smaller one. So I've just made a little diagram just to show which way round they go. And I'm now going to take them out. Take all of them out. So I have a feeling, I'm just trying to figure out which way round this went in here. That, um, yeah... I could have sworn that was one that was lighting up. No, let's take them all out. I'm going to do it the easy way. Okay. I'll just unplug that as well. It'll be switched off, but... Well, first of all, as soon as I touched it, the track has come away here. So that was obviously a very dodgy connection. Yeah. It was broke even before I even soldered it. So we can fix that. Take that one out. Uh, the middle one is the... Green one. Okay. Take this one out. A bit tied up in the wires, there it goes. And then we'll have this end one out, so it's here. Okay. There's our three LEDs. Let's have a look. Let's use the component analyzer. Nice thing with this, doesn't matter which wires you stick on, it will figure out what it is and test it. And also, it's quite powerful enough to light up an LED. So this is the green one. No component detected. Yeah. No, so that green LED... Okay, no component detected. Uh, so that green LED doesn't work. Let's have a look at these two. Okay. It says it's an LED. Didn't see it light up though, let's have a look. Oh yes, it does light up. That's a good one. Just one do. This was really short in the circuit. Not on to it. Okay. No, I can't get today. It's got like a plastic little sleeve on it. Try that. Okay. And it came off. Push the plastic sleeve up where we can actually make a connection. Let's try again. Okay. Well, that says it's an LED as well. So, for some reason, one was really short and circuit. I'm sure it was. Let's have a look. Yeah, okay. So, both the red LEDs are good. The green one doesn't work. We'll just try it again. And then one of them was really short in circuit, okay? Yeah, no component detected. Okay. 
Let's have a look why this was reading short. So we want to go into the back of the board where the LED uh, is. Put this way you can see it. That reads near to short, yeah. Okay. And the other one. Well, part of the tabs broke off. Oh, they actually both read really near to short and circuit. I must just have a bad connection on it. It's actually reading really ohms. 55 ohms. Well, we can say they both read the same, so we can assume that's right. So we can replace the two red ones, even though one wasn't lighting up for some reason. We can get a new green one. And now let's see what it does. That's done then. I've uh, just put a bit of wire in here. This is where the pad just, just fell off before I even unsoldered it. Uh, this one effectively broke when I tried to solder it back in. That's the green LED. Now, I haven't got one long enough. But I've just stuck one in there for now. Hopefully, we'll be able to see it down the hole. Uh, I've only got a few salvaged green ones and 3mm. I've got plenty of new ones and other colours. But anyway... Let's see if it works, yeah. I've had to tag these wires back on because they eventually snapped off. That's the two red ones. So, having just fixed a few soldering issues, let's put this back together with the batteries and see what it does now. Well, both the red LEDs come on now and they're flickering a little bit. Maybe, you know, this thing effectively is a bit primitive and it's just charging these batteries at the full current that will flow through the resistors, which is like 15 ohms, basically. And then eventually the chip will decide they're fully charged. It'll switch the base of that other transistor on and the green LED will come on. So let's just leave it now a while. Let's see if it actually does charge up. I'm at the house now, guys. This is the room I do my video editing and I just brought the charger home with me because I left it on during the afternoon and it was just charging. So I brought it in and in the end I just left it overnight and you can see uh, this morning the green light's on, it's obviously charged. So the circuit must actually operate in the way that I eventually figured out. And it appears the only thing wrong with this was um, a faulty LED, uh, a broken track by one of the other LEDs. And the first one, the one to the left, was actually intermittent at first. I noticed if I sort of pushed on it it came on and then stayed on so i'm guessing that was just bad soldering as well really so there you go not really the uh, cause of the fault it was charging just the indicators didn't work yeah guys if you made it this far without skipping anything i hope you enjoyed the video and i hope you take something useful away from it i'm sure you can see now what i'm talking about about the way of thinking the analytical way of thinking about repair work I can show you how I do it, but I can't teach you how to do it. And a part of that I didn't mention at the beginning it is also a fact that different engineers will have taken the different route to get to the same place. And the ones that did get to the fix may have done it much quicker than me. They may still be working their way through it, but they may well get there. And this is really what I'm trying to express and why I say I can't teach you this. Nobody can. I can show you, but only you can learn it. You will develop your own way, your own path. Sure, you get some guidance. But those of you who keep on doing this sort of work and repairing things like this is the way to do it. If you don't accept little challenges like this, you're not going to really get to where you want to be, I'm sure those of you who do, you will definitely be the top engineers of tomorrow or next year. And I'm sure you will be able to make a good living if you wish, or just a very interesting hobby and a lot of satisfaction you will gain out of doing this sort of work. Okay, hope you enjoyed it anyway, maybe giving you something to think about a little bit. And hopefully I will see you all soon on another Learning Electronics Repair video. Ciao for now, guys.